Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. These are words from Yahusha given to his disciples. This is found in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 through 27. Extremely important words that should be placed in full perspective of all who believe in Messiah. He tells us to come through the narrow gate that leads to life, but that way is difficult and there are few who find it. He said many go in the broad way that leads to destruction. He warned us to beware of false prophets, those that come in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So there are false prophets that will come to us acting as if they are peaceful, gentle, loving, and caring. But on the inside, in their hearts, they are aggressive, self-serving, savage, and seeking to devour you. He said we will know them by their fruits. He also said not everyone who calls on him will enter in his kingdom. Even those who prophesy in his name, who have done many wonders in his name, who even casted out demons in his name. But he will declare to them, he never knew them. They practiced lawlessness. They did what they wanted to do without care for his word and his commands. And he ended this with a great illustration of what it looks like for the wise who built their foundation on him, rather than the foolish who built their foundation on a shaky, not firm foundation. The foolish fall, and it's a great fall. These words are a warning to us all. They are powerful when they are applied because we know things for certain. We know that we must be narrow in walking out our faith towards his kingdom. We know that we must be aware that there are false prophets seeking to devour us. We must understand that if he does not know you, you will not enter into his kingdom. It doesn't matter if you called on his name, did wonders in his name, cast out demons in his name. And we must build our foundation on rock that is unmovable, a firm foundation in his word, and not by man and his liberally changing ways. This understanding is important to have in order to understand this topic that we're going to discuss in this video. When I first thought about discussing it, I was first led to verses 21 through 23 of Matthew 7, because that was initially what came to my spirit when thinking about it. But when reading it all again, I was led to go over much more of this chapter because it all pertains to the subject. This video is for all, but it absolutely is directed towards the many and the older generations from the Great Depression babies on down. Many people love Yah. Now, if you're new to this channel, I do not use that Anglo-Saxon English words to refer to our creator. So please don't mistake me. You say the Lord. I say Yah or Yahuwah. If you question it, go to Psalms chapter 68 verse 4 and see it for yourself. Now, like I was saying, 
In regards to the older generations, many people love Yah and they have called on his name. But unfortunately, they have also come across false prophets and teachers that were inwardly ravenous wolves and they rooted their knowledge of Yah on bad fruit and sandy ground that is leading many of them to try to enter into Yah's kingdom through a very broad gate. Now many people, when they hear this, the devil comes in your spirit and says, I know this can't be me. I have dedicated my life to Jesus and I am not deceived. That pride in your faith, it decides to jump in and stand real tall, which closes your ears and your heart to what I'm about to convey. But please remember that this pride is the sin of Lucifer and it is not what you need at this time. If at the end of this, you feel it doesn't apply to you, then that's fair. It is, of course, your right to disagree. But I'm asking for an open ear and heart because the good news of our Messiah is the most important thing. But there has been a subtle deception that has been added to our faith that has been distributed within the walls of the churches and religious organizations proclaiming the doctrine of Christianity. And my hope is that if it has infected you and you are able to diagnose it within yourself and let down the spirit of pride, our Father to clean out that infection and you can walk through the narrow gate and enter into his kingdom. So we need to discuss the social gospel. Let's begin. Okay, so have you heard of the social gospel? I know when I was in the churches, I never heard this term. The pastors never spoke of it. I never heard them label the gospel. Well, I mean, I heard of the prosperity gospel and that again has major flaws and holes in it. But the prosperity gospel just stemmed from the social gospel. It was the next leg to Satan's deception, a gospel for those that weren't affected as much by the social issues. I will get to the prosperity gospel in another video, Father willing, but we need to discuss this social gospel. In my last video, I did give an introduction to the social gospel, but before I explain it, let me explain first where I'm going with all this. The preachers of the gospel in America introduce many to Yahusha. In English, you say Jesus Christ. Again, please don't get caught up on this. I'm just trying to be clear. If you want to understand more, I have made a video about this. You can watch it later so there's no confusion. But these preachers explain to us that Jesus died for our sins. They had us praise him, of course, and hold on to the fact that because we believed in Jesus, we are going to heaven when we die. Now, I'm just doing a summation. I promise I'm not headed to blaspheme. But while they had our trust and assurance because of this, what was also done subtly is that they changed his true purpose and made the gate to his kingdom much more broader. I'll sum it up like this. As a believer in Yahusha, our lives should be committed to bringing in the kingdom of heaven. But the lives of the church was changed to a social salvation, bringing in a better worldly kingdom on earth aside from our father's kingdom. The purpose of the gospel was subtly changed and many people fell for it and was unaware of it. That is a summary, but I'm going to break it down to show you. For more perspective, let's go to the second to last chapter of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21 verses one through four. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. You see, this is Yah's kingdom and the promise to all who believe in him. Please make the distinction. It's not that you die to go to heaven doctrine, but that's another story. This is his promise and his kingdom. But the question is, do you know how we get there? Well, if you don't, Revelation chapter 4 through 20 gives a very telling breakdown of it. You see, this is Bible prophecy and it will be fulfilled. But let me ask you, 
Does your church do a lot of heavy teachings on the book of Revelation? When you think of it, as long as many of us have attended church, would you say that the churches have given a strong understanding of what Yah has prophesied to come and what we should expect? Like many of us know the good news that Yahushua died for our sins and paid the penalty for us so that we can be redeemed to our Father and be presented to Him through belief in Yahushua. Many of us know this, and I think the churches for the most part have done their part in explaining that part of the message. But there is more to the word than that. Now please understand, I am not discounting the importance of our message of salvation. But Yah's word is full of history, of instruction, as well as prophecy. Yah prophesied of the world to come and what his goal was for it. He didn't stop at the gift of grace through Yahushua. Even before Yahushua, he prophesied of the end times and what that would look like. In the book of Daniel, there is a lot of end times prophecy. And like I was just saying, the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy of what is to come. It starts with the message to the seven churches, in which we should always read and make sure we are not guilty of any of the charges Yahushua brings to the churches. But after that, from chapters 4 to the end, it's all prophecy waiting to be fulfilled. It is important understanding that every believer in the Bible should obviously have a strong grasp of. But I want you to think about it. We were taught about what Yah has done for us through his gift of grace. Yes, we were taught this. But then, why aren't our teachers teaching us what Yah has prophesied about this world and what's to come to it? In our churches, we are taught what everyone calls the Lord's Prayer. And in part of that prayer, we are to say, For his kingdom come. And a few minutes ago, I just read to you some of what is prophesied of his kingdom that's coming found in Revelation chapter 21. So how could we be praying for something, but our pastors and churches aren't really teaching us about his kingdom and how it will come? Are you following this? There are countless churches here in America, different denominations. In America, which is claimed to be the largest Protestant Christian population in the world, there are over 230 to 250 million declared Christians though they're saying this number is declining. Shocking, right? And in the world, there are 2.3 billion declared Christians and Catholics. A third of the world population is said to believe in Yahushua the Messiah. But of that number, really ask yourself, how many people are actually working towards his kingdom? How many people actually understand how it is to come? Do you actually believe that all of these professing Christians around the world actually see the mark of the beast coming? The Antichrist rising? The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls being poured out? And the great tribulation coming upon the world? Do you really think that many of the Christians in this world see this happening? I know in my family, many don't see it. If you're being honest with yourself, you would know the answer is no. The churches are not teaching Bible prophecy and what Yah has prophesied about his kingdom. Because while they have introduced the world to Jesus, they have not laid a foundation of Yah's full word and what the kingdom of heaven looks like and is. They have given people a part of the gospel while adding a remix. They don't teach on the book of Revelation and end times Bible prophecy. They are actually a confirmation of scripture. What I'm speaking about is that scripture in Matthew chapter 7 when it says where we are to be aware of false prophets. You see, they have distracted the world from Yah's coming kingdom because they are promoting a false kingdom on earth that precedes Yah's. You'll find this all in the book of Revelation. I cannot go over it in full in this video, but I have made a book of Revelation series as well as made videos about end times Bible prophecy. If you'd like to know more, which I hope that you do, please watch those. But let me speed it up here. With all these churches around the world, the real reason the majority are not teaching on Yah's kingdom and most people know very little about Bible prophecy is because the gospel that people have been receiving over the past century and a half is a tainted false one that is actually leading to the wrong side of fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This false gospel are leading those who follow it to be on the wrong side of Bible prophecy that receives the harsh penalty and judgment to the lake of fire. You see, the good side of Bible prophecy is found in the end when Yah's kingdom comes. 
but much of the prophecy that you see before you get there is about what happens to those not seeking his kingdom, but try to create their own earth. These are the ones being deceived by Satan, and the hardest part that you're going to have to deal with is the reflection to recognize that it could be you that was part of this deception. Again, pride will tell you it's not possible, but if you put Yah first and allow his spirit to be your guide in this and yield to him, he will provide you with the understanding. So listen, what has happened is that while the world was receiving a part of the gospel, the ministers were coming out of the darkness and providing subtle changes in the foundation so that as long as they had you dependent on them to receive the gospel and to hear from God, they could direct you to where they wanted the world to go. Unlike you see today, back in the early 20th century, politics wasn't always preached in the churches. Churches were never political, but just look at how political they are today. Presidential candidates, mayoral, gubernatorial, congressional, any major candidate running for office often goes to the churches for support. Did Yah ever once tell you he was using politics to bring about his kingdom? Did he ever tell us that we were going to be able to vote our way into his kingdom? Did he ever say that some political leader will bring about his kingdom on earth for the whole world? No, that is actually prophesied for the Antichrist. Messengers of darkness took hold of the message of salvation in order to pervert it into bringing about Satan's kingdom on earth. As Satan has used familiar themes found in the scriptures to gain credibility and assistance from those who, if they truly understood what was happening, they would be opposed to his agenda and what he was actually doing. Now, like I said, I spoke about this in my last video, which was about MLK, but it also introduced the social gospel. In that introduction to it, I explained the social gospel was a social reform movement that gained traction in the United States after the Civil War. The advocates of this movement interpreted the kingdom of God as requiring social salvation, as well as individual personal salvation, meaning you should be saved personally through Jesus, but the kingdom of God required that our communities receive salvation as well. They sought the betterment of industrialized society through the application of biblical principles of charity and justice. The social gospel emphasized how the ethical teachings of Jesus could fix the problems caused by Gilded Age capitalism. So what was going on was that during this Gilded Age of capitalism, which was a time period from the 1870s to the early 1900s, this was a time of rapid economic growth. This was the time of the rise of power of the robber barons, the wealth of the Rockefellers, Morgans, DuPonts, Carnegies, etc. were built during this period. Through the strength of the industries, they built the economic power of America. It was not the United States government that did this, but these wealthy families. During this economic rise, American cities had become magnets for cheap labor. Poverty was breeding a new kind of hopelessness. Those wealthy captains of industry like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller were seen as being indifferent or just not caring to the sufferings of the poor, which was probably true. They justify their indifference and cruelty because of their belief in social Darwinism and the survival of the fittest. The strong devour the weak. This is why they were called the robber barons, which simply means a person who has become rich through ruthless and unscrupulous business practices. And so, because of the harsh conditions that were created because of the business practices of these men, Christian ministers created a social gospel to combat against them. Many Christians came to believe that through reform efforts, through reform legislation dealing with child labor, dealing with the slums and their substandard living conditions and their unsafe work conditions, if they targeted those issues, human beings really could build the kingdom of God on earth. This is what they believed. The social gospel movement leaders took Yahusha's message of love thy neighbor into their pulpits. They published books and lectures about it all across the country. The famous phrase from Charles Selden's book in 1897, What Would Jesus Do?, became the major theme of thought within the movement. Washington Gladden called it social salvation. This concept emphasized that religion's fundamental purpose 
was to create systemic changes in American political structures. One of the leaders of this movement was Walter Rauschenbusch, who wrote the book Christianity and the Social Crisis. This book pushed Rauschenbusch and his social gospel into the nation's consciousness. In his book, he writes, Christ's conception of the kingdom of God came to me as a new revelation. Here is the idea and purpose that had dominated the mind of the master himself. I found this new conception strangely satisfying. It responded to all the old and all the new elements of my religious life. Rauschenbusch started an organization called the Brotherhood of the Kingdom. This was a Jesuit organization. After its first gathering in 1893, the Brotherhood adopted a mission statement and eight principles to govern its organization, unity, purpose, and ongoing commitment to public propagation for the social gospel. These they called the spirit and aims of the Brotherhood. The spirit of God is moving men in our generation toward a better understanding of the idea of the kingdom of God on earth. Obeying the thought of our master and trusting in the power and guidance of the spirit, we form ourselves into a brotherhood of the kingdom in order to reestablish this idea in the thought of the church and to assist in its practical realization in this world. Their principles were, one, Every member shall, by personal life, exemplify obedience to the ethics of Jesus. 2. Each member shall propagate the thoughts of Jesus to the limits of his or her ability in private conversation, by correspondence, and through the pulpit, platform, and press. 3. Each member shall lay special stress on the social aims of Christianity and shall endeavor to make Christ's teaching concerning wealth operative in the church. 4. On the other hand, members shall take pains to keep in contact with the common people and to infuse the religious spirit into the efforts for social amelioration. 5. The members shall seek to strengthen the bond of brotherhood by frequent meetings for prayer and discussion, by correspondence, exchange of articles written, etc. 6. Regular reports shall be made of the work done by members in such manner as the executive committee may appoint. 7. The members shall seek to procure one another opportunities for public propaganda. 8. If necessary, they shall give their support to one another in the public defense of the truth and shall jealously guard the freedom of discussion for any man who is impelled by the love of the truth to utter his thoughts. Listen. These men were not advocates of the full faith of the scriptures. They were advocates of some of the principles found in the scriptures given by Yahusha, and they then have used those principles as the basis for their movement. They believed in Jesus just enough to use him as a way to promote their doctrine for society. Basically, take these principles that Christ taught us and use them to promote the world we live in. Again, and let me drive it home. If you read up on any of this movement, they were about bringing about the kingdom of God on earth. This is what they were about. This is not about the same kingdom of God that I referred to earlier in this video from Revelation chapter 21. At this point, you should be able to recognize this. This was them creating their own kingdom of God on earth through their own power, becoming in the name of Jesus. This gets very deep, and I do not want to get ahead of myself here. But perhaps the best known advocate for the social gospel was Michael King Jr., who I spoke about in that last video. In his writings, he tells specifically that he was inspired by the writings of Rauschenbusch. In his book, Stride Toward Freedom, The Montgomery Story, in chapter 6 titled, Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, on page 91, he writes, I spent a great deal of time reading the works of the great social philosophers. I came early to Walter Rauschenbusch's Christianity and the Social Crisis, which left an indelible imprint on my thinking by giving me a theological basis for the social concern which had already grown up in me as a result of my early experiences. Of course, there were points at which I differed with Rauschenbusch. But in spite of these shortcomings, Rauschenbusch had done a great service for the Christian church by insisting that the gospel deals with the whole man not only his soul, but his body, 
not only his spiritual well-being, but his material well-being. It has been my conviction ever since reading Rauschenbusch that any religion which professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned about the social and economic conditions that scar the soul is a spiritually moribund religion, only waiting for the day to be buried. It well has been said, a religion that ends up with the individual ends. That's the social gospel. This is not biblical. Our salvation through Messiah is not a social one that is saving our communities. It is an individual issue and has always been. But these men didn't agree with this, so they interpreted the gospel to be what they desired it to be. Now, from reading the MLK quote, I jumped to the late 1950s with this book because he clearly was influenced by this brotherhood of the kingdom. In his speeches, he didn't declare out loud and let everyone know where his influences were coming from. He just took their influences and made it his own and promoted the social gospel in his own way. But here's the real craziness of this social gospel. Those satanic robber barons who created the harsh economic conditions for the society, now they were who the gospel must be directed to in order for them to do more for the less advantaged for them to do more for those without the same means as them. They created the problem, and then the social gospel would be the movement to use the power of man to bring about the changes they needed through political and social reforms. This is blasphemy, but this was a major movement in the churches. Rauschenbusch linked Christianity to emergent theories of democratic socialism, which he believed would lead to equality and a just society. Him and the ministers before him steered this gospel movement. You must understand that Jesus was still being taught in the churches, but what was happening is that instead of people applying the word in full, the kingdom of God according to prophecy and revelation was no longer a consideration, and what was being promoted was people using their faith in Jesus to create their kingdom of God on earth, here. And And so politics became a huge driver of this social gospel. This was the beginning of the social gospel movement here in America. And it became the foundation of the gospel in the United States, right before the Great Depression generation started, which is the oldest generation alive today. Yes, it is true that this generation grew up with a strong sense of church and religion. Jesus was a major fabric of their culture. The country was still segregated at this time, and there were two separate racial groups, the white Americans and the Negroes, those that descended from the former slaves. And this social gospel grew amongst them both for different reasons. Now, also understand that this social gospel was promoted heavy here in America. So what I'm speaking on is from an American's perspective. But for many of you around the world, please do not feel that this is an American subject only. The format and doctrine was built here in America, yes, but it was used all over the world. So once you understand the format and the beliefs, you can then tie it to where you are. I recently made a video about the Bible. And in that video, when I was referring to this, different Bible versions that were created, I explained that all the modern day so-called easy to read versions have been corrupted by Luciferian worshiping occultists. In that video about the Bible, I brought up the Theosophical Movement. During the same time period that the social gospel was built, there was a Theosophical Movement. Theosophy is any of a number of philosophies maintaining that a knowledge of God may be achieved through spiritual ecstasy, direct intuition, or special individual relations. You see, Theosophy is the worship of Lucifer. Helena Blavatsky and Henry S. Olcott founded the Theosophical Society in 1875. They were occultists, and their number one goal, as stated in the Seeker Doctrine, a book written by Vlavosky, was to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of man without distinction of race, color, sex, or creed. That's the Seeker Doctrine, written in 1888, index page 32. Vlavosky, who was the founder of 
Blue Surfer Magazine in 1887, and editor Andy Besant, along with other occultists, believed that Christian churches were the key to introducing the doctrines of Lucifer to large masses of people. The 1904 annual report of the Theosophical Society stated, I believe it is through the churches and not through the Theosophical Society that Theosophy, the worship of Lucifer, must and should come to large bodies of people in the West. Found in Transactions of the Theosophical Society, H.P. Blavatsky, Annie Besant, 1904, page 377. And then just eight years later, the 1912 report of the Theosophical Society stated, Our lodges continue their propaganda work. Outside the lodges, many of the members engage in what is really theosophical work, such as lecturing, talking on the principles we are trying to put forward, preaching and other activities in connection with the Christian churches and other organizations. You can find this in the Theophysis magazine, Annie Passant, year 1912, page 88. So in this agenda to spread their theosophy movement, part of it was them creating revisions to the scriptures, like when we get the NIV or the NLT version of the Bible. But what has been hidden from research or just not dots that have been connected is that the social gospel was also a part of this movement. They said that the churches would be used to spread their theosophy. And they used the social gospel in order to do this. This is how they got through in the churches. And many people that were attached to the doctrines of the churches were unknowingly moving in to create Lucifer's kingdom while they believed that they were actually serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's deceptive. Now, what I just explained was the beginning of this movement. You needed to understand the foundation of the social gospel because as we go through modern history, it will be the framework of foundation for Christianity and politics in America and the other leaders in the world that elevated themselves through the cause of social justice. This is their framework. As time moves on, this movement grows and it's intertwined within the churches. There is no separation of it and it has brought us to the place in time where we currently are. You should understand that the devil is trying to create his own kingdom on earth. This is what comes before Yah's kingdom in Revelation chapter 21. Like we find in Revelation chapter 13 verse 7, it says, It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And then in Daniel chapter 7 verse 23, it says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. That is the kingdom of the Antichrist, which in modern day terms is referred to as the New World Order. And all the social justice, inequality, and economic care, and health care, and all of that will come according to this satanic kingdom. The social gospel was just laying the moral foundation for their pursuit of this kingdom. This is Bible prophecy, and it has to happen. But the thing that most people may not have considered is that they were taken and led right in this deception, which is why they are so involved politically in this world and believe in the power of their vote. They believe they can change the world for the good, even though Yah has already prophesied what is to come to this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with Elohim? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of Elohim. That's James chapter 4 verse 4. You see, the social gospel makes us friends of the world and active participants in the change that it's moving towards. But this change that the world is moving towards is in direct contradiction of the word of the Most High. All of the liberal changes that is found in this world right now, seeking equality for all, goes directly against the Bible, and that's not hard to see. This is the beginning and foundation of the social gospel, but there is much more that needs to be discussed and considered. So we will have to continue with this in the next part. But this important foundational understanding needed to be considered. You have to ask yourself, in your faith, are you moving towards the kingdom of Yah or the kingdom of Satan? 
by your own will and desires are you trying to bring about God's kingdom here on earth? You see, people, we are in the times of Bible prophecy. And the saints that will enter in Yah's kingdom are going to go through the narrow gate, not a broad one that leads to destruction. We know Yahusha, not just by his name, but in a true relationship based on his will and not the direction that the world has steered us in. We are not being led and steered by these false prophets that have pushed this false gospel. Our faith is built on our Messiah, who is our rock. It is time that you have a serious reflection on your faith and make sure you understand what has been happening here. Listen, there is a high probability that you have been affected and influenced by the social gospel. So don't lie to yourself and say that you haven't been. Not your church. Don't say that. You probably have been deceived, and that is normal. Satan has deceived the whole world. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. But what's not right is living in it or being so proud to say it can't be you. You run a huge risk, and Yah has told you what will happen to those entering in that broad gate that he does not know. You don't want to take that risk. It is extremely important that at this time, you make sure you reflect and repent. Your pride is not worth the lake of fire. Admit the deception and then root it out and cancel it. The decision is yours and you don't have a lot of time to make it. Father willing, we will continue this discussion of the social gospel. But until that time, read your Bible. Don't follow man, follow his word. Give the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, authority in your life to purge out the wickedness and replace it with his fruits. Don't just listen to my words, but use them as a new motivation to review your faith based on the word and not from these churches and these pastors. It is highly important that you make the right decision right now. So please, commit your life to Yahusha the Messiah. Be in a personal relationship with him, not a social one, a personal relationship with him. And live a life committed to a father's business to bring about his true kingdom make it the purpose of your life his kingdom will come his will be done be blessed hallelujah praise you okay thanks again for watching if this has blessed you please don't forget to like and share this video with others this video is for the older generation, so if you are able to, please share this with your parents and your grandparents, the elders and the older generations. They need to hear this message. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Please don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. Listen, I'm thankful for all of you. Thank you especially to those Elohim has placed it on your hearts to give and you have done so. This ministry is not easy and your donations truly help. Your blessings truly support this ministry. Thank you for your obedience to Yah's call on your heart. I thank all of you for the support. Okay, thanks again for watching everyone. I love you all.